I think I ended with Leia in the year 1848, the revolutionary year in German and Central European history, when what he's really hoping for is a church structure which will be independent of the state. And he's hoping also that the Lutherans in Bavaria will come together into an evangelical Lutheran church and leave the United and the Reformed behind them and have what he calls unmixed supper fellowship. Uh, usually, see, in, in German, you can use a noun as an adjective. But in English, uh, like for example, communion and supper, you can't turn into adjectives all that easily. So Abendmahlsgemeinschaft would be Eucharistic fellowship. But what he, he's talking about is unmixed fellowship in the sacrament of the altar. Now, one of the things though he does at the end of 1848 is he says, we don't want to focus just on confession and liturgy, vital though they be, we must also focus on life. And he produces this proposal for apostolic life, which is very much like a sort of updated, slightly cleaned up version of Spena. But I think he would resent it if I said slightly cleaned up because he would maintain Spena wasn't that bad. He maintained that except at a certain stage when he gets into the office of the ministry. Then he, he, he says that the pietists didn't distinguish properly between the ordained ministry and the royal priesthood of the laity. But to my mind, it's not until the early 1850s, well, I suppose when he's squaring off with Walther, as he sees it, that he, that he for the first time expresses criticism of pietists. But now, what I'm interested in, though, is in this writing, where Leia the pietist is very clearly there before our eyes. He says, well, what is motivating me to this and what is pushing me to this vision of Christian life is the sacrament of the altar. So he says, the sacrament of the altar is for us much more than a mere doctrine. The conflict about it is in our eyes no mere conflict of opinion. Here we are dealing with the greatest act of God that encounters us in life, with the union of the glorified body and precious blood of Jesus with bread and wine. And in the sacrament, we stand on the highest summit of Christian life in time, where Godhead and manhood meet in Christ. His true body and blood make us members of his body and impress, impress on our body the seal of the resurrection. So now, um, again, I think you could say here without knowing it, he's part in company with at least some of the pietists. But it's interesting, when Leia was a student at Erlangen and starting to get distinctively Lutheran views, he sent to a friend something that Schbener had written on the sacrament of the altar. And he said to him, this is really good Lutheran stuff. Um, now, as far as I know, he never expresses any distance with Schbener on the sacrament of the altar. And actually, Schbener didn't deny the real presence as such. But it's interesting, he says, the Lord's Supper is the greatest act of God that encounters us in life. And he sees this as that in which the Christian life subsists. And um, I wonder if Matthew Harrison is, you know, getting his, what does he call it? He has those words that he uses. I mean, he has, um, I've forgotten the words he uses. We're Canadian. So we're not, we're not in bondage to that stuff like you are. Uh, but uh, maturia and koinonia, what's the other one? Diakonia. Yeah. Yeah, Tom Kochuk, uh, Tom Winger gave a homily in which he said that those slogans misunderstand the Greek words, but then he said it's much better than the alive or, or ablaze stuff, you know. 
but but anyway, that whole. What what is Leo besides the besides the Pietist influences like Spener and Stark? Where's the neo Lutheranism? What what's Leo reading? Where's the influence for for this other stuff? Oh, thank you. That's a really good question, and I'm not entirely sure. Uh, because he wrote so much of his own. You wonder what he read of other people. A very interesting feature of the early 19th century and the first half of the 19th century in all confessions is how many lay people were interested in theology and how many magazines were published. And oftentimes on a monthly basis, which indicates there was just a huge volume of literature being produced. So in England, for example, once the Oxford movement got underway, all kinds of magazines. And in the German neo-Lutheran movement, the same thing. Um, hmm. you, you really stumped me there. And I'd like, I'd like to know the answer to your question. I mean, he must have read what the other guys were doing. But he was writing so much of it himself. And Leia's writings have relatively few quotations in them. Uh, there's some quotation. And for example, when he got into the scrap with Walther on the ministry, he said, well, two can play that game. He says, well, Walther, you quote your Lutheran fathers for your view. And then in his second aphorisms, he then quotes a bunch of Lutheran fathers who, as he sees it, is, uh, are doing it his way. But he does not develop his argument in terms of quotation. And I suppose as we look at the last generation, Kurt Marquardt did hardly anything without quotation. He usually had a quotation, then he developed it, and then there was another quotation. Does Scare quote all the time? I don't know. Some subjects are so touchy, I'd probably not, not go, better not go there. Uh, but Leia does not. I mean, he, he develops it, and he will refer to. Um, well, you know, the Book of Concord, Luther himself. Uh, I mean, the, the Neo-Lutherans do go back to Luther and the Book of Concord. Um, he must have known about the other guys because he, he critiques them. Herfling was one of the Neo-Lutherans who was a pure functionalist. Well, he disagreed with Herfling, so he must have read him. And uh, the guy who was a friend of the King of Bavaria and of Leia was Adolf von Harles, who was from Nuremberg, and then he was a professor in Leipzig or Dresden. I said Dresden this morning, I think Leipzig now, and it doesn't matter anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah. OK. Now, again, you see, so Leia, when he talks about Christian life, he thinks it's all in the sacrament of the altar. I think Matthew Harrison would probably say that too, when he encourages all the Mother Teresa stuff. You know, that's probably where he's getting it from. But then, also, by the way, Leia was a sacramental missiologist. Uh, He's really big into inner mission, you know, like getting to Germans who've fallen away from the church. And then he's promoting the mission in North America and in other parts of the world. He, uh, on the 20th Sunday after Trinity, 1866, he preached a big Sunday service and, and people are gathering to mark the 25th anniversary of the North American work. And of course, he has a few things to say about how hurt he is that some people have turned away from him, don't communicate with him, and they've, you know, they've broken all fellowship with him. And he's not too pleased about that, as you might imagine. But he says, why have we done, engaged in this help for North America? We wanted to prevent the members of Christ on the other side of the ocean from being separated from the body of Christ. We wanted to preserve Eucharistic fellowship. Well, I like the word Eucharist, you see. 
So I said Eucharistic fellowship. He says Abendmahlsgemeinschaft, supper fellowship. You know, there are some people who don't like any critiques being made of drafts they write, of dogmatics books. You'd never guess who. <laughs> but they, they just don't like it if you offer comments. They go into terrible huffs. And well, you know, I did my thing. Daniel Price read it and he writes back and he says, well, you know, prune your manuscript by between a quarter and a third. And then he was all ticked off I used the word Eucharist too much. Well, I backed off to some degree, but I mean, he was paying for the thing. <laughs> the advantage now, I'm getting old, I can just use the word I want to use now. But anyway, but he says he wants to preserve sacramental fellowship with our abandoned brothers in faith in America. We wanted to prevent a state of affairs where on the sod of earth on which they were building, our brothers who had gone across the ocean would forget the holiest and best heritage of the homeland, the sacrament of the altar. They ate one bread with us in the homeland, so also in the far distance they should be one body with us. What moved the Society for Inner Mission and what the leaders of this whole enterprise became increasingly conscious of in the course of years was nothing other than the wish to keep the American brethren in the communion of faith and of the sacrament. We cannot conceive our intention in higher or holier terms. And again, I think that's been a theme with Matthew Harrison because he was a vicar in Northern Canada with Lutheran Association of Missionaries and Pilots. And he was really talked out of shape that he was obliged to um, actually assist at joint communions, even with the United Church of Canada, which is, I mean, not only reformed, but mega liberal. And so his big thing was, you know, Lutheran mission produces Lutheran congregations and churches. Well, he may have got that to some degree from uh, Leia. And then he goes on, this aim, this very aim, dear brothers, has miscarried in so many ways. Just think how in America, entire hosts have turned from us. That's you lot. How they have rescinded Eucharistic fellowship with us and thereby torn up the most beautiful and holiest bond that could have joined brethren on both sides of the ocean. This fills the soul with sorrow. Now, I'm going to leave out the stuff about Leia's health. I've already told you about his declining health. And um, even, even long before he does these Lord's Supper sermons in 1866, in German Lutheranism as a whole, Luther, Leia had emerged as the standard bearer, the flag bearer for the sacrament of the altar. So... In 1848, and again, I mean, he's publishing like crazy at this time. He published a gospel postal, so he was encouraged to produce books of sermons. Now, again, that's a thing that Christians of all confessions did in the 19th century. If you had a reputation as a good preacher, you published a book of sermons. And today, it's sometimes dumb, but it doesn't seem to carry the same force and vigor as it did back then. Anyway, uh, there was an elderly academic, Dr. Gotthilf Heinrich von Schubert, born 1780, died 1860 in Munich. He's a philosopher and scientist, and J.G. Herder, Herder, who ended up as a Lutheran superintendent bishop, he was his headmaster at high school, and Schubert, says to Leia, thank you for what you're doing to bring the sacrament of the altar to the fore. He says, how your sermons for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday strengthened and uplifted me yesterday and today. The Lord has called and cons consecrated you to be over against the unholy spirit of our time, a proclaimer and witness of the heavenly powers that lie in the sacrament of the altar. Now, 
There are 20 sermons in the series. He had jotted down 20 headings. I don't think they correspond in any way. In some of the sermons, there are some texts like 1 Corinthians 5, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, let us keep the feast. And then 1 Corinthians 10, the cup of blessing that we bless, the bread that we break. They are vital for Leah. And so he'll preach on them two and three times. Uh, he preaches on various texts. Um, the first sermon in the series is on Exodus chapter 12. It was delivered on the 27th of July, 1866. What's interesting in the first sermon, as he looks at the Passover, is he talks about how the Jews in Fiat keep the Passover. And he, he's obviously, it's almost as though he's been in Jewish homes to see it happen. You know, maybe he's been to the synagogue service, he has Jewish friends, he sees what they do at home. And very like Franz Dalich, he really likes Jews. I mean, he doesn't have anything racial against them. Uh, he wants to draw close to them. But of course, he hasn't got into the John Paul II, Pope Francis stuff. He still thinks they need to be converted. And apparently one of his first Zentlinge, the emissaries that he trained, was a converted Jew whom he'd baptized, a guy called Baumgarten, whom he sent over and who then was a worker over here. Now, um, well, he's talking about Jewish customs. I am no Jew, but I grew up among Jews. I've seen all of these things. My mind and my eyes have been open from youth for all the liturgical splendor that the Jews still have today, even when they don't understand it or have cast it aside. The whole thing often stirred my emotions. So like Dalich, he kind of likes Jews. He wants to get together with them. And it seems that the Jews at that time liked that kind of Christian attention, even though they knew it had an evangelistic purpose that presumably many of them wanted to resist. Now, um, yeah, he talks about how in Exodus 12 you have the one-off description of the first Passover night. Then you have the institution of the memorial. He, he really gets into Passover lamb. And already in the first sermon, he says, from now on, your life should only alternate between preparation for and reception of the sacrament. So he says, really, either you're giving thanks for the last time you received or you're preparing for the next time you receive. And he's trying to get people into that pattern. Now, as I read the first sermon, I, I just uh, read something by Dr. Scare. He had something in the latest CTQ where he's talking about how John 6 is Eucharistic. And I thought even by Dr. Scare's standards, the argument was rather vigorously put, you know. And the impression you got from the article was that the opponents don't really have much of a case. And, you know, that was, this was scare with his punching bag, as it were. And I noticed an unofficial publication vigorously attacked him. Now, but then the first sermon, I thought, spoke to the issue that scare was dealing with. Um, Let's see if I can back that up for you. What, scared, what, what, what Leah does is he says, well, the Jews eat the Passover lamb. And he, Leah maintains that in a certain way, the Lord's Supper is already instituted in intention with the Passover lamb. Because the real Passover lamb is Christ. And what do you do with Passover lambs? Well, you eat them. I mean, presumably you don't just look 
at the cooked and roasted beast. You know, you carve it up and eat it. And he develops an argument which strikes me as pretty cogent and compelling. And even when you have John the Baptist, you see, he says, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Well, he's talking about a sacrifice. He's talking about atonement. But what do you do with Passover lambs? I mean, you invariably eat them. And so it almost seems that the institution of the Lord's Supper is implicit there in the proclamation of John the Baptist. Well, Leah looks at Exodus, but he also looks at um, the Gospels. And he, he says, once Jesus starts his public activity, well, he's intending Calvary. And therefore, he's also intending the sacrament of the altar. He's intending the means of grace. Years ago, John Kleinig told me that the whole ministry of Christ was a preparation for the institution of baptism, absolution, sacrament of the altar. So that everything our Lord is doing, he knows where it's going, where it's going to be consummated. And he knows how his salvation is going to be distributed to the end of time. So everything from our Lord's point of view is directed to the upper room. I find that compelling. You may or you may not, I guess. He says, when we read the two miraculous feedings of Jesus, of the 5,000 and of the 4,000, and we have not found the idea that the Lord here had his New Testament Passover in his mind's eye, and that what he did a year ahead of time was nothing other than the anticipatory act of his spirit, who already clearly knew what he intended to do on the night when he was betrayed. The feedings of Jesus are nothing but prior celebrations for fire. Um, anyone who does not know this has not seen the eye that glances at him in the two feedings. So he's saying, you know, as our Lord does this, he's intending to do much more than the multiplication of the loaves. The Lord Jesus held his two feedings, intending for, that people would get a preview of the kind of meal he attended, intended to establish for his own. I find that kind of cogent. You see, I remember many years ago reading in an English evangelical, might have been an Anglican evangelical, who said the sacraments aren't that important. And he said, well, in the New Testament, you have so many verses which deal with the atonement. And then maybe a tenth or a fifteenth of that volume deal with the Lord's Supper. Therefore, he said, the Lord's Supper is much, much less important than the atonement. He didn't connect the two. And he seemed to think that only where the sacrament would be most explicitly mentioned can the scripture be talking about the sacrament or referring to the sacrament. I think that's fundamentally misguided. And uh, I find Leia's argument compelling. Let's, he takes a decisive step back. And now what he says, and I have a quotation. He says, the Lord had or God had the Lord's Supper in mind in Exodus 12. And, um, well, it's interesting, there's no wine in Exodus 12. Jewish practice supplied wine. It's providentially supplied, isn't it? So that it's there in the upper room. Anyway, let me quote. In the Old Testament as a whole, the Lord plays a comely prelude to all his great deeds in redemption. And the prelude is the musical prelude, a forspiel. It's the prelude before the service. In the Egyptian Passover celebration, he mirrors nothing other than his holy meal. The meal is so important and great to him that already he instituted it thousands of years previously. As the ship hastens to land, so his spirit hurries to that evening on which he intended to institute the covenant meal of the New Testament. This is his great aim. And he encompasses all salvation in this 
covenant meal. This is what his eye is fastened on. It's sein Augenpunkt. It's the point that his eyes are going to. In the three years of his life, and I think he means ministry, the Lord Jesus had in view nothing more than the quiet evening in the Seneca, Cena, so Cenaculum is the room where you have supper. In the, whole his, in the whole of history, his spirit envisaged nothing more than this most holy meal. Well, John Gerhardt says there are direct prophecies of the Holy Supper, and there are also types which announce it, and he sees both. Now, um, anyway, I, I find this kind of compelling. In the sermon, by the way, he says about Paul's words on marriage in Ephesians. He says, well, they deal with marriage, he says, and they deal with the church. But he says they deal even more with the Holy Supper, where it is written, the mystery is great. These words in Ephesians 5 are so structured that a clear eye can see therein nothing other than the sacrament of the Lord Christ and the congregation and the mystery of their complete unity. This is nothing other than the Holy Supper. So if marriage pictures Christ and the church, well, where does Christ and the church become most actual? As you are distributing, I would think. And, um, well, there are so many of you uh, are ordained men, and you probably, um, and, and the freshly ordained men are probably starting to realize it. You have an almost close, intimate, physical relationship with people when you commune them. I mean, they're allowing you to put food in their mouths, which after toddlerhood, yeah, after toddlerhood, you don't do that. You know what I mean? Whereas, you know, you, you can kind of understand why lay people sometimes don't like lay people distributing and like ordained men to distribute. They think, okay, well, that's your calling. I'll trust you to do that. But it is a very intimate moment, isn't it, when you commune? I had a two-year vacancy, and I knew everybody by name. And oftentimes, I didn't even have to look at them. You could kind of feel. And you knew it was Sansa, don't you, as you commune? And in one of the latest sermons, he even talks about the difficulties of communion and how some people are hard to commune. He says they're schwer anzudienen, because you know they keep their head down, the lady has a big hat on, and, uh, you know, and so he gives instructions on, he says, even if you doubled over, put your head up, you know, so, <laughs> so that you can commune. But it is a most intimate moment, and it really is like a formation of the church moment, isn't it? That you're permitted to be instrumental in, but you realize that much more than you is going on, you know. So it is a most glorious and holy moment in that way. Now, Leia can keep two balls in the air at the same time. That's a sign of scholasticism. I think the Lutheran Orthodox could do that. They could say on the one hand, on the other, and I prefer this view over that view. Or, or they could see strength in two views. Leia gave one sermon, that's on St. Lawrence Day, 1866, 10th of August. He's talking about the Lucan account. And what he said, the text is, this do, this do in remembrance of me, tuta poiete. And he says stuff that the congregation does not expect. In the next sermon, he tipped it over and did the reverse side. Now, they know he is Mr. Unmixed Eucharistic Fellowship. And Reformed folks and United folks are not going to be communed in Neuen Dettelsau. He, in the whole sermon, he develops an argument and he says, this do, he says, Christ is unarmed. He's a poor man. He's going into death. He's in the shadow of death. He says, this do. And he says, 1800 and some years later, all across the world, there's a growing number of people who take this command seriously. He says, the great ones of the earth, the, you know, the rulers who have armies to back them, they give their severe commands, they encounter resistance, they get their own way through force. There's absolutely no force about this command. 
But this poor man heading into death says, this do. He says, well, the papists are doing it, the orthodox are doing it, the Protestants are doing it, and the Lutherans are doing it. And he says, this is the greatest evidence for a deep down some uh, Christian unity somehow in the depths. And he, he says, the Lord's command has been an, a miraculous success, a lofty indication of the agreement of the entirety of Christendom to a certain degree. And he says, well, you know, a father gives a strict command and his sons obey us. And then the moment he dies, they feel, well, they've reached adulthood and we're no longer under the force of that command. We can do our own thing. But the Lord gives this command and we keep on following this. Now, and uh, you know, Vatican II has the idea of the imperfect communion of all Christians. And somebody who probably wouldn't be treated with the greatest veneration in this gathering, Sam Nafska, didn't he have the idea of levels of relationship and that was levels of fellowship? Well, Leia has that. Um, and he, he, ta he talks about, uh, he says, not only through special blessing, but through the nature of the thing itself that grows out of the unifying word of belonging together and a feeling of belonging together that points to more and pushes toward the communion of saints. And this is something great. So Leia comes out as somewhat of an ecumenist in this one sermon. So he says, well, Everybody in whatever way is obedient to the command. And then he says, there's somehow an impulse toward agreement and fellowship. And then he says, thirdly, everybody thinks it's somehow good for you. He says, even a Zwinglian who thinks there's nothing there believes in some way it's going to be good for you. Now, I, I gave a lecture at Fort Wayne on Leia's view of ecumenism. And I thought I was pretty broad-minded and whatnot. I thought it was a nifty paper. And Thomas Schatzauer, I think he referred to this homily, which at the time I hadn't read or had forgotten. And he kind of threw me. Because, you know, I said, well, on the one hand, on the one hand, but on the other hand, Leia, he's not really an ecumenist in the modern way. Well, Schatzauer, OK, can quote that one sermon. Now, the next week, Leia gets up and he says, I shocked you all because you've never heard me say anything like that before. And he says, well, those three things I said are true. But he says, today, that follows a presentation of an opposite kind from last time. Today, he said, I shall show you the disagreements. So he says, the Lord says, this do. Now, Leia, being very even-handed, he says, well, we're all of us at fault. But number one, the Romans are at fault. They halved the sacrament. And so he, and, and Leia really hates the halving of the sacrament. So he really goes on about two kinds. Then he says, you know, the cup of blessing that we bless, how do you bless it except through the words, through the you know, thanksgiving and the, the words? He says, the reformed don't bless the sacrament. And that's really major. Then he says, the Lutherans don't break the sacrament. And I must read Mark Braden, because he's got something in Gottesdien saying, Leia is wrong. But I doubt if he's directly going for Leia. And anyway, and Leia says, well, here in Neuen Dettelsau, we break. But I mean, I doubt if he would have heard it, because he didn't have a microphone on the altar. Today, you know, if you have a big host and there's a microphone, in an Anglican church, you hear the break. But with us, you, well, anyway. He says, um, yes, I usually break, but the Lutheran church does not break. And so the Lutheran church also has a share in the universal disobedience. Now, and uh, he, um, when he's talking about blessing, he thinks you bless through, through the prayer of thanksgiving and through the words. And he really focuses on how the preface uh, is part of the blessing, consummated by the words. And many Lutherans don't have the blessing. And I'm going to get to Pastor's question. 
when he, he says, he says, many Lutherans don't have the preface. The Lutheran church as she now is, is a corrupt and deviant group where everyone does something different at his altar. And since they are not agreement about, in agreement about what is and is not necessary, there's certainly a bunch of people who know nothing of the preface, for there is gruesome ignorance even among the pastors. Plus ça change, please. I, I just wondered if you could maybe say a little more about this breaking of the bread. Um, I mean, what is it that leads Leia to, uh, to do this, this ceremony as part of the Lord's command? Why, why does he take it in that way rather than in reference to the distribution? Yeah. I'm just curious what's behind that. Yeah. Well, I think very clearly, you see, he talks about obedience. And he does that, have that pious, pietous sight to him. If the Lord tells you to do something, you do it, and you don't alter it. And so he would see the thanksgiving and the consecration and the distribution as the Lord did this, therefore you must do it. And, but then he's picked up the idea from his Jewish acquaintance that the breaking is part of the blessing. Yeah, the deaconesses are the deaconesses are baking individual hosts. Yeah, they're, they're not baking a giant loaf that he breaks up to distribute. Yeah, I, I, I wonder whether he broke a small one or he had a larger one. I don't know. Because they were, I mean, they still have the molds. They're not, they weren't baking a giant loaf of bread. Yeah. If, if it's about obedience to the original command and, and, and reenacting it the way it was, then he's have established something host. different. Yeah, then you'd have to break every host. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and through the sermons, he, he keeps mentioning this. And he almost says, the practice at nine Dettles are is superior. Um, <laughs> I've always picked up Lutherans don't do it. So, like Anglicans do it at the consecration. And if there's a PA system, you hear it. And in Cranmer's right, you know, here the minister taketh the bread into his hands, and here he breaketh, you know. And what's interesting is the Anglicans in the 16th century were somewhat reformed, but by 1662, uh, you kind of do stuff at the words, which indicate that those elements are being blessed, which is very unreformed. You know, but in Leia's day, well, even today, in the church in Württemberg, southwest Germany, which claims to be Lutheran, the consecration is forbidden because it's so popish. So what they do in Baden-Württemberg is the elements are on the altar, the pastor turns around, and he reads one of the accounts of the institution. But he does not bless. And it's made clear, I mean, nothing happens to the elements. And so Leia didn't regard himself as in communion with that church. And Leia visited, have you ever heard of uh, Friedrich Blumhart, father and son? Well, th these two pietists, father and son, they were at Bard Ball, they had an apocalyptic expectation of the return of Christ. Because you know, Bengal, the Swabian pietist, worked it out, the Lord would return in, was it 1736 or something? And he didn't, you know. And, um, <laughs> and anyway, the Blumharts were very interesting. They were into healings and exorcisms, charismatic stuff. And Leia went and visited them at one point, didn't commune with them, and found out he was able to be a bit more social than he thought he, he would be able to. But he was really shocked that they didn't bless the sacrament. And then I think Blumhart came and visited Leia, and he was freaked out in Nine Dettelsar. He said, there were too many crucifixes for my taste. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not surprised that there's been some question about the practice of the fracture, because um, surely he knew that there was a division between the Lutherans and the Reformed yeah. hmm. historically over that very thing because yeah. the Reformed were more concerned with the action whereas the Lutherans were concerned about the real thing. Did, is there any indication that he was aware of that history and just ignored it? Or? Yes, yes. I mean, he says that the Reformed wanted to make a symbolic point. Uh, 
and he appreciates why many Lutherans do what they do. But he did innovate at this point. Um, I mean, I've been shocked at times when it's done. And you think, well, do you know what church you're in? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, not that I think it invalidates the, the sacrament. Well, I mean, you've seen it done apart from the altar. You know, they turn around and then you see pieces flying here and there. Yeah. 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 And again, I mean, they probably think they're getting the symbolism across. And then they're kind of missing something. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't want to um, defend in any way what he's doing, but just to highlight it. Now, um, moving right along, if we may, I've been talking about uh, what Leah does to try to embellish the right. And it's clear by 1853, uh, it's in Nicholas, he can do everything he wanted to do in the first edition of the agenda. And, you know, he's got the preface back, etc., etc. Now, you can kind of understand why, even if they hadn't scrapped about the ministry, Walther, well, uh, you know, would have had some reservations about Leia. Um, um, in the neo-Lutheran movement, some of them took the view that the 16th century restored perfection. And what you have to do is go back and repristinate the 16th century. And once you get to that 16th century doctrine and practice, you're there. Did Walther think that? He probably did. I mean, we, you know, we can't call him up on a cell phone and check that he, he did. Uh, I kind of think he took that view that the Lutheran Reformation is definitive and you can't possibly go beyond it. Well, Leia, in these years after 1848, he, he comes to the view, doctrine and practice and liturgy stand in need of further development. And that view of development is interesting and viclong. It's in the air at the time, because John Henry Newman wrote the book, The Development of Doctrine. And, and uh, you know, in, in certain parts of the Roman communion, there were people talking about developments, and Leia is into developments. And, uh, well, as I say, even if he and Walther hadn't scrapped on the ministry, Walther's eyebrows would simply have been raised by that stuff. And undoubtedly, many of the neo-Lutherans thought the same way. But in the second edition of the agenda, Leia has a preface. And there he says, the 16th century wasn't perfect. We need to go back to the ancient liturgies. And we need to carry the Lutheran stuff forward in keeping with the thrust of the Lutheran Reformation. He wanted to have a blessing of the baptismal water. He wanted to introduce blessing of objects used in worship. And, um, and then in the 1853 agenda, what he does is he reproduces the liturgy from 1844. But he has footnotes, and then he has appendices. And there he talks about what he would like to develop further. Well, one of the things is the offertory. We don't know to what extent he was able to do that. Um, he doesn't really talk about breaking of the bread there. He, um, there's other stuff he does talk about, and this is further, further evidence that Leia is not a receptionist. One of the things he brings in is what he calls the confessio corporis the confession of the body. And um, what he has is just before the distribution, and, it, and you see it's very unclear whether he introduced it. He goes to the Nuremberg church orders of the 16th century, and what he has is the pastor is about to approach the people with the body and the blood. 
And he says, you know, dear, dear Christians, this is the true body of Christ in which he suffered for you. This is the precious blood in which he made atonement for you. I, I don't have the actu actual wording in front of me, I'm afraid. Uh, and that would be part of the evidence that he's got over his receptionism. And a brother came to me in the, uh, break, in the lunch break and had layers uh, catechism questions where, you know, he says it doesn't matter if you spill consecrated wine because the blood of the Lord is not united with us. Well, that must have been something that he picked up at an early date. And you wonder what he did in later editions. I, I really don't know. Now, this confessio corporis, probably he didn't introduce it at the main service in Neuendettelsau. But for his holy ladies, he probably did. And the holy ladies would have had, you know, a holy thrill that the pastor, you know, emphasized the presence in this way. And then again, the people at the, uh, at the little communions, he would have done that for them. So, now I'm wondering which way to go. Anyone want to give me any guidance? Well, I'd really like to hear about this quia. Uh, what, what, you said you had something about uh, Leia's uh, version of uh, confessional subscription. I'd like you to get to that. Yes, because Leia, in this year 1848, you see, I, I think Leia had thought there wouldn't be very much he could do to alter the external life of the church because the church was under the control of the state. And you, you, you couldn't move sideways. You, you couldn't turn an inch without the approval of the consistory. In Ansbach, there was a Lutheran consistory. In Munich, there was a consistory which was Lutheran, United, and Reformed. And all kinds of details of practice were decreed by the consistory. So when Leo went to now in Detelsau, the consistory was forbidding private confession and absolution. Then they changed that, and then you're allowed to engage in private confession and absolution again. Although they forbade the absolving of children prior to confirmation. Yeah. And so one of the things, you see, Leia had that, he had his fight with the church government, like, 1851, 2, 3, he almost was kicked out. Um, but then Harless comes in as the bishop equivalent, and there was a thaw. But then in 1857, a, a lady who was in the infirmary of the deaconess house, an aristocrat lady, she was 70 years old, pretty ill, she asked for anointing. And Leia said yes, and he anointed her. And then he published in some magazine the apostolic sick visit, and he admitted he had anointed the woman. Well, there were, in Bavaria, Protestant Bavaria erupted in wrath and fury. This guy is a papist maniac. And Harless rebuked him, and he was specifically forbidden, never you dare anoint again. And we don't care what the New Testament says about it. That's Catholic, and you don't do it. <laughs> you see? Now, there was... There was other stuff he was told off about. It's just gone out of my mind. But there was something that he did, just in terms of practice. Oh, yeah. The consistory discovered he had been absolving children before they were confirmed. And they told him, you know, we've heard these very serious accusations, and you better stop doing that. And then in 1860, Leia refused to perform a remarriage. And you see, in Bavaria, I mean, the Catholics couldn't get divorced. And then, of course, obviously, after the Franconian territories are brought in, they have, they have to operate the Protestant divorce laws. Well, the church consistory said, Joe is an innocent party, and you must remarry him. And Leia said, no, I don't think he's an innocent party, and he wouldn't remarry him. And so the consistory suspended Leia from the ministry for three months. And he was just in the parsonage, and he wasn't allowed to do anything. 
And, you know, the 85% of people who were with him, they just went to other churches and they abandoned the parish church. And the biographer says, the godless came to services in the meantime. So those who were neither awoken nor reborn, they came to whoop it up. And I love it. There was an old man dying. And Leo went to see him and said, I'm awfully sorry. I can't commune you. And if you die, I can't bury you. And the old man said, Herr Pastor, I prayed to the Lord that I won't die until you come back. After three months, they lifted the suspension, although Leia wouldn't admit he was wrong. And I think he got to visit the old guy, commune him, he died, he buried him. And the old guy just hung on till the Herr Farah came back. You see? Now, Leia, in 1848, he developed what we call his churchly program. And it was a four-plank four platform. And one of it was that you had to have the rightly understood queer subscription and unmixed Eucharistic fellowship. What are the other things? Another one was to restore the diaconate. And then he had this proposal for uh, um, godly living, the Piet Cong stuff. Oh, and then he had a, a proposal about polity, you know, in what he was saying about the ministry. So he has this four-plank four platform. But, um, well, I don't know. In, in this writing, Unsere Kirchliche Lage, our churchly situation. It's very interesting. He says, there's a group in the General Synod which is Lutheran. But there are Lutherans who are loosey-goosey, there are united, there are reformed, and there are rationalists. And he is the leader of the Lutheran party. But what he does is he talks about the queer subscription but then he backs off and he says that, well, you see, some people had said, we subscribe to the spirit but not the letter of the confessions. And he says he doesn't subscribe to every last remark, every last incidental remark, but he says he confesses what is said confessingly, bekennend which is a German uh, participle, present participle, used as an adverb. He gets into the Smalkald articles, and he has the most trouble with the Smalkald articles. I think he finds Luther is just too exuberant there. And what's interesting is, though, he's actually dealing with contents. And, um, well, obviously, it's different from Walther's queer which comes up a little bit later on. Isn't that 1855? And Walther's essay on subscription must be intended as a reply to Leia. And, uh, and Leia says that the Missourians get it wrong. He says, the Missourians say, you interpret scripture according to the confession. And Leia says, no, you interpret the confession according to scripture. So he sees scripture as critiquing the confession at all time, or norming the confession. Um, what I want to do is read carefully what he says. And I don't know whether it works. Probably it doesn't work. But he clearly thinks it does work. Do you know, are there specific, I mean, does he not like the Pope being the Antichrist? I mean, do you know, are there specific things? Is it exegetical opinions, or is it... Ah, the eschatological stuff will come into it. Because he will say the Pope can be an Antichrist, but he expects the to arise at a certain point to be a specific individual who then gets done in. But it, it ties in eschatologically with the millennialism and the kiliasm stuff, which he certainly did get into. Andrew. Um, so, it, you, you mentioned that there was a spirit 
uh, kind of going around it with, with a, 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 pro, a spirit of process. Um, and, and Klaus Harms, is that his name? The guy who wrote the 95 Theses in 1817. Mm -hmm. I mean, he seemed to have had this in his 95 Theses as well, this kind of idea of process. Is there, is there uh, would you, would it be fair to say that, that uh, Leia, kind of along with most everyone else, is, is kind of uh, breathing in the air of George Hegel a little bit? Uh, I, I don't think it would be Hegel as such. Leia spent a semester in Berlin in 1831. And he went to Schleiermacher's lectures. Apparently, Schleiermacher had very, very penetrating eyes. And in that lecture, apparently, Schleiermacher was talking. And apparently, you could never get Schleiermacher off his train of thought. And Leia got him with his eyes. And Schleiermacher lost it. And for about five minutes, he, he didn't come back into his lecture. And on one occasion, Leia went to Hegel's lecture. And he wrote in his diary, understood nothing, dash, nothing to understand. <laughs> nichts verstanden, nichts zu verstehen. Uh, I don't think it was Hegel. I, I think there's something I don't know too much about. I wish I did. Uh, romanticism. You see, the Enlightenment, there's a reaction against the Enlightenment and its rationalism known as Romanticism. And the Awakening and all those movements at that time were influenced by Romanticism. So in England, the Oxford Movement by Sir Walter Scott and his novels. And in Germany, um, there's you know Goethe and all that kind of jazz and the, the poetry of the age. And apparently, Leia had a Schiller phase. Like there were some of these poets that he really got into. And that can be very much part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Peter. You mentioned that he had sermons on specific texts like 1 Corinthians 5 and 10. I'm wondering if in that, in that series, did he preach on 1 Corinthians 11? And did he have any comments on like, what is the worthy reception or what is the examining oneself or discerning the body, you know, some of these things that today oh, yes. are controversial. Yes, I mean, absolutely certainly, Leia would not be an infant communion guy. And in his circumstances, you, can, you can't really see him um, being even an early communion guy. But he's probably accused of it, right? Yeah, he might be accused of it. In my biography of him, I've got the year of his confirmation down somewhere. I'm not sure how old he was at confirmation. He was probably about 14. Uh, he might even have been a little older. Uh, but yes, he does preach on 1 Corinthians 11. Just at the end, uh, on 30th of November, 7th of December, so St. Andrew's Day and Pearl Harbor Day, he has 1 Corinthians 11. Now, the way he gets into worthy communion is, well, the pastor has a responsibility to check out the spiritual life of the communicants. Now, he does talk about you examining yourself, but it's in the context of the announcements, confession, and absolution. That is the setting in which he deals with it. And uh, it's really very interesting what he does. He says, when, when he got to Nine Dettelsau, they only had the corporate confession and absolution. For some years, that continued. And then, all of a sudden, the majority wanted private confession. And the minority continued to do public confession only. And he says, he says I, I don't think the spiritual condition of those is very good who only ever use the corporate rite. He doesn't think that's very healthy. He thinks you can do that for a while, but you do need that one-on-one -on -one stuff with the pastor. And of course, because you have to announce, you, 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 you can't dodge the pastor. So if there's something that he knows about, he does have the opportunity to raise it with you. Now, I had a two-year vacancy in which I 
tackled quite a bit of um, shack up stuff. And there was a German English congregation. And I'd be preaching in the German, and I'd use the word abgeschackt. And no one ever asked me to translate it. So, ach, es so furchtbar, dass eure Kinder abgeschackt sind. Terrible that your kids are ab, abgeschackt. And I talk about the abgeschacktheit. And they just look, and they never ask, was ist das? <laughs> you know. And um, is this being recorded? Yeah. <laughs> is it? I remember being in one marital situation, and that was years before that. And there was a couple where the old man accused the old lady of infidelity. No. And she leapt up and she said, you think that I've been screwing around. But what she said was, du meinst, dass ich herumgescrewed bin. <laughs> and I had to pinch myself so I didn't laugh. Because that was really something else. But, um, but you see, what I found in that situation was there were situations I knew about. And I'd see some young woman who I knew was shacked up living somewhere else. And before the service, I would try in the narthex to get to the family and to get to the young woman. Well, you, you know my size. And you'd have a bunch of big guys from the family would sort of just make sure you couldn't get to her before you had to go to the altar. Well, what do you do? Because you should, you know, talk to people. Uh, it's not a good idea just to, you know, throw this at the altar, you're not communing. And I think the deepest tragedy there is where you have people who think of themselves as really good church people and they don't see what the problem is. You know, they think it's just your opinion or, or you've invented that rule or, or whatever. Um, that was an answer to Peter's question. Do you want more? Uh, well, did he say any more on the discerning the body? Did he take that as a... No, I mean, for him, that would be the Lord's body. Okay. Uh, that, that wouldn't be the church. Um, I mean, that interpretation where it's the church is a, a reformed view which has come into Lutheranism very recently. And I'm amazed by how many Missouri Synod Lutherans think that discerning the body means discerning, you know, the communion of the church and not the Lord's body and blood in the elements. It's amazing how much of that's around, especially given that Luther so carefully goes into that. I, I don't think that, the, that for the most part in our circles, the controversy is not over whose body is it. It's over, it's over what does discern mean. Can, can mm. I, because the question usually is, can I, is it possible for an infant to discern the body of Christ? Is that, does discern the body of Christ mean faith? And does the, does the infant receive the word, the verba by faith and then discern it? Or that's usually, I think, where we're not, I don't think there's a lot of people arguing yeah, yeah. about that. Well, Leia would simply not get into that stuff. And I mean, that would be a problematic he couldn't even imagine, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Paul. Two questions. Uh, first, you talked about Walter kind of going after Leia later. Uh, one of the issues that I believe they also uh, were at loggerheads over, uh, and Walter put the essay out against the modern theory of open questions. Leia pretty forcefully advocated for open questions, did he not? Uh. I don't know that he would have called them open questions. He would have seen areas where he wanted development. And he would see areas where there, there isn't clarity and you need to move forward toward clarity. I think the open questions was more of an Iowa Synod thing. Um, eschatologically, by the way, the pietists developed all kinds of ideas about a thousand year reign and stuff that happens before the final end. And uh, quite a lot of the Lutherans in the Neo-Lutheran revival took in a lot of that pietist stuff. And Leia, at one point, he, he was sick. I, I don't know which sickness it was. I, I think it was the 1857 sickness, and that's where he had a brain fever. fever. <laughs> and uh, 
and he, he had a reflection on some New Testament text, and then he published a, a really killer sermon. Well, I mean, you could say in his own defense he'd had brain fever. Fever. It's fever in German. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The second question is, uh, with respect to how Leah handled conflict, we, we know that he, he had some with Walter. Uh, what, what are patterns are you observing about how he approached a disagreement with a brother pastor? Uh, how, how he sought to resolve that disagreement? And perhaps you can pick an example that was successful, where they came to one mind, and another where they remained at disagreement. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, do, but bear in mind, Leia had executive authority over nobody. I mean, you know, he is the half pharaoh in Neuendertelsau, period. Now, he published his agenda, and there was a pastor in a neighboring parish published an attack on the agenda and said this was the most, this was a danger for the evangelical church. It was pure popery. Leia got all his ideas from the Roman breviary. He really attacked Leia. And some dissidents in Leia's congregation forwarded the book to the consistory and said, see, you've got to get rid of Pastor Leia. And the consistory responded and said, no, um, there's no basis for the complaint at all. And you know, whatever problems there are with Leia, this is not it. Well, Leia apparently was very nice to the man and uh, just never bothered to argue with them, never scrapped with them. And then one day, this pastor came over to Neuendertelsau and apologized and said, you know, I was wrong. And then they got on very well. And then in the second edition of the agenda, Leia mentioned him very graciously in the foreword, but without naming him. Um, but bear in mind, he doesn't have authority over anybody. So, I mean, he can't really excommunicate anybody. He can decide who takes communion in Nine Dettelsau, and that's it. Now, the Erlangen faculty, all of them disagreed with Leia on the ministry. They appear to have, most of them, taken the herfling functionalist view. It's very interesting to see whom he calls do and whom he calls z. And those, I think, that he had you know, been with when they were about 20, 21, like Harless. Even when Harless is president of the upper consistory, uh, they'll always write to each other as, you know, dear, highly reverend, you know, hair, this, this, and this. And then they'll just use the do form, which is very familiar. And he does that with Harless. I think with Tomasius, Gottfried Tomasius, he was, like you, he was a kenotic Christologian. You know, you know kenosis, where the Lord limits certain of his attributes and divine stuff. Um, it's nonsense, but Tomasius advocated that. Tomasius was very loosey-goosey on open communion. But, I mean, Leia, you know, went to see him and um, the whole faculty disagreed with what he wrote on the ministry. They were uncomfortable with his view on fellowship. Some of them said, well, yes, there's a long-term goal, that's okay. But in the meantime, you know, reality and pastoral discretion won't allow for that stuff. So they disagreed with him. But he, he called the Erlangen faculty his befriended opponents. Meine befreundeten Gegner. So it's kind of, well, we're friends. Well, they wouldn't sit down for a beer for obvious reasons. But, um, you know, they'd sit down for a, I don't know what. You know. Uh, now, well, the, the case of where it wasn't resolved is with the Missouri Synod. But, you know, there's something ridiculous. When Walter invited him to come to North America, I mean, you couldn't fly from Frankfurt on the Main to Chicago. It would be a terrific journey. Uh, he's a widower with three children, and he has a parish and everything. I mean, it would take 
eight months to go to and from the States. I mean, it would be just a tremendous journey. And, you know, you didn't have email. Well, if you had Twitter, the conflict would have been much more severe, wouldn't it? Because everybody would have been chipping in. And, you know, Grabo would be blogging. And it would have been 10 times worse. Um, well, he knew in the Bavarian church, he was on the far right, you know. And um, in, I think, yeah, in 1849, 1853, he submitted all these petitions asking for change. Von Harles came in, and in 1857, the layer group just came and smiled sweetly at everybody, and they hoped that things were going to go their way. They weren't. In 1861, Leia reissued an appeal for closed communion. And, uh, the, and the synod decided to go on to the next business. Like they got to that point and they said, oh, we've got the, the petition from Pastor Leia. And they basically said, no, we're not even going to deal with that stuff. And, and that's a year after his suspension. And he said, I don't belong in this church. But uh, he just continues and dies in the church. But I mean, he was never of one heart and soul with the Bavarian church. He saw himself as in fellowship with the separated Lutherans in Prussia. Yeah. So thanks for that question. But uh, yeah. Actually, conflict in the parish would be an interesting thing. Uh, there's, one, there's one of those biographies, isn't it? Love Leaves Home, where some guy in the Missouri Synod writes a schmutzy biography of Leia and talks about how everything was peachy in Neuen Dettelsau. Everybody loved everybody, and it was just so nice. It was an idol. I once read a Waltha biography about how you know, in the last years of Walther, it was just peace, sweetness, and oh, it was just so lovely. Well, human life is never like that. So that's nonsense. Now, clearly the great majority of the parishioners did rally around the pastor. And they did gel. That's very clear. Leia wrote a letter to a pastor in the Prussian Union who'd sent his daughter for deaconess training. And the pastor wondered why she couldn't receive Holy Communion. Leia wrote a beautiful letter, dear brother, and he was full of esteem, and he explained why, you know, this just won't go. Leia says, and here in Neuen Dettelsau, we discussed this, and everybody agreed. And we agreed that this is the Lutheran's only policy. Now, Walther has his theses on, you know, communion with those of a different confession. Those theses are a bit more strident. And, and I think the reason is the Missouri Synod is bringing in the German immigrants, uh, some of whom will be united, some of whom will be loosey-goosey Lutheran. And all of a sudden, they're finding a form of discipline that they have not known before. So I think in that case, Walt is backs to the wall, and he has to be a bit more vigorous. Now, just with Neuen Dettelsau, Leia said, well, no, they all agree with me that only such people can commune. So it, it's clear they're not fighting. Now, in, in our churchly situation, he does talk about one thing that's interesting. Um, in a large church in Germany, see, sometimes you had even 11 pastors at a big city church. And in Nuremberg, you would have seven and five pastors. And the pastors would represent different directions in the church. And so the parishioner could decide which was to be his father confessor, which would admit him to communion, and to whose communion service he would go. And Leia, he talks in our churchly situation, he says, well, and this is much more difficult in the country where there's only the one. So there were clearly some of the communicant members who wanted a, a loosey-goosey union guy and obviously he wasn't it. So it's clear, you see, there were some who did not appreciate him, but they were a tiny minority. <laughs>
Now, how he handled them, I don't know. And again, I mean, he, he was the her pastor. And uh, on formal liturgical occasions, apparently when you went to confession, you didn't use the Z form, you used the Uber form. You see, the form you use to royalty and people way above you is ear, which is usually the familiar plural. But when you use it in the singular, like, if you use a, a formal title like Your Holiness, Your Grace, Your Majesty, you use the ear form, like Eure Majestät, and so on and so forth. And so Leia's wife used to go to confession to him. Well, during the engagement, she moved from Z to Do, but when she went to confession, she called him Ihr Hochwürdiger Herr Pastor. You know, you top. Right Reverend Herr Pastor, you know. And Luther, in a 1533 writing, he talks about if people don't want to say Reverend Herr Pastor when they go to confession, because it's too formal, he says, then they can just say Vater, Father, you know. But in that German situation, I mean, you would use that elevated title for people above you. And it was obvious, and you do it for all kinds of people. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we're getting into the last stretch, are we, yeah. Pastor? I was wondering if um, we have maybe five minutes or so. Uh, regarding Walter and um, Leia, we are fairly well aware of their differences on church and ministry. But I'm wondering if you could say a little more about how or whether they had uh, extended conversations or letters regarding receptions and um, None regarding whatever. Regarding None whatever what? about that. Um, Please repeat the question for us. Regarding, regarding, I'm wondering about uh, the, uh, the differences or the conversations that Walter and Leo might have had regarding receptionism or consecrations and the second. Uh, yeah. we know, of course, we know how people ended up on the subject. But yes. No, no communication, whatever, but that would not be significant. And when you look at Walther, I used to think Walther came about the most out of receptionism because he does quote consecrationists in his pastoral theology and he does insist on the consumption and proper treatment of the reliquiae Species, you know, the, the remaining bread and wine. And, and Walther, what amuses me, or bemuses me, is people who call themselves major Waltherians, and they do stuff that would shock Walther. So Walther in the pastoral talks about having all the vessels in front of you and taking the lids off, and how, you know, you do the consecration and you very clearly indicate with the sign of the cross precisely what you are consecrating. And then he talks about having a little bit more available just in case you need to do a reconsecration. consecration is big on the reconsecration. He really hammers that home. But Walther insists upon it. And so I've seen people who call themselves Waltherians. They'll turn around with one host, bless it, and not bless anything else. And they think they're Waltherian. Well, no. If you check out Walther, He's pretty fussy about this. Well, well Peter thought himself Waltherian, and he's kind of a receptionist, but he gets to his dogmatic. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Kurt Markwood told me something that, uh, because he said it, it must be right. He said, someone once asked uh, J.T. Muller, he sa said to J.T. Muller, there's stuff in Peter that's not in your book. Why not? And he said, I didn't find it in the Bible. And apparently, someone once asked Peter, said, there's stuff in your dogmatics. Or the, the stuff in Walther that's not in your dogmatics. So I didn't find it in the Bible. So there does seem to have been a watering down of the substance as you go on. You know, from a gold, a silver, and a bronze age to a plastic disposable age. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. Um, now, some interesting stuff. Leia is a very, very vigorous sola scriptura guy. He loves Christian history. I mean, he just loves to know 
all kinds of people in liturgical commemorations. He's very interested in history. Uh, he is, uh, and he's got this from Christian Kraft, his reformed teacher. I mean, you have to show it to him in the Bible. And Leah, by the way, he'll say, the institution of the Lord's Supper is in the Gospels. So he'll see the institution there. He'll say, now, we want to go to tradition on the Lord's Supper. And he says, well, we go to St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. And for him, that is the definitive apostolic tradition, and that is authoritative. Now, he does love antiquity and then Lutheran antiquity, and he loves to quote from it, but he does not base on that stuff. So he has one sermon that I was going to end with where he really gets into Irenaeus, and he loves that second century stuff. But then he says, well, all they're doing is expounding scripture. So he is a, a thousand percent of a sola scriptura kind of guy. And um, well, we can, I have various other topics to think about. He, he really talks about the union of the church on earth and in heaven in the sacrament of the altar. I think there's something deeply personal going on. He got married in the summer of 1837, November of 1843. She's aged 23, I think, or 24. Helena Andrea Leia died. She's overcome by a swift illness, dies. Leia was absolutely devastated. His mother, who was a very tough character, advises him to remarry. Her mother was the second wife of her husband, who went through one daughter and then takes the next one out of the family. That was a German tradition, by the way. If your wife dies, you marry the daughter. Sorry, not the daughter, you marry the younger sister. And, you know, it must be Levirate marriage in the other direction, or something like that. And Leia refused to do that. And he remained single. Now, in some ways, it's cruel to say it. He's almost like Queen Victoria. And you see, when Prince Albert died in 1861, Albert Edward, the Prince of Wales, had been playing up. He had impacted his father's health. And for the next 40 years, Victoria blamed the Prince of Wales for his father's death. Victoria wears black, refuses to be, you know, bright and cheery and smiles by accident, really, for the next 40 years. And she made the royal family's life a misery. Like Albert's rooms remained untouched. And he sort of pretended that the spirit of the prince consort is still around. She drove the royal family nuts. So I think Leia drove his family nuts so the same way with Helena. They had to pray, you know, mentioning Helena, commemorating Helena every day thanking God that she was praying for them and you know, expressing communion with Helena. And, and every year on the anniversary of his wife's death, you know, he draws all the curtains, he has candles burning on the family altar, and he's just pure misery all day. And I think he makes the kids go through that and torments them. But with that big need, I think there's a, a felt need really that he has to feel the closeness of the dear departed in the sacrament of the altar. That's much better than what Victoria did. I mean, she just had seances to try and have touch with Albus. And I love the story that, you know, she hated Prime Minister Gladstone. She said, he speaks to us as though we were a public meeting. And then she loved the Jewish convert Disraeli who charmed Victoria and kind of flirted with her. And when Disraeli was on his deathbed, she wanted to visit him. And he had terrible bronchitis. And he said the last thing he could take is the queen being so sick. And so she sent, the, um, she sent her secretary, her youngest son, the Duke of Albany. And the Duke of Albany says, you know, Mama wants to come and visit you, my lord. And, and he says, no, no, no I, I really just couldn't take that. And then he says to the young prince, and besides my boy, She'd only want me to take a message to Albert, you know. And, and, and Victoria was creepy because Disraeli got put in a crypt. And she went to, you know, the church where he was in a crypt and she had the crypt opened. 
and she had a little table and a chair put in next to his coffin. And she put a, you know, a, 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 a pottery bowl of uh, primroses, his favorite flower on his coffin. And she sat and visited with him for a few hours and had tea and had a nice conversation with him. So she was creepy. And what he did was a bit better. Now, he has one sermon which goes kind of, it's in the series, but off the series. It's a Sunday sermon, and it's on the widow's son of Nain, and it belongs to the series. And it's, it's fascinating. I reread it this morning, and I really wish I could go through it in some depth and detail. He says, the widow's son of Nain, he preaches it at one of the little communions. It must have taken a coon's age to preach. I mean, really, it's long. But, you know, I mean, he's a German, and you go on and on and on. It's a long sermon, and he says, the widow's son at Nain is, is, is one of the readings you can use at the grave. He says, First Thessalonians is obvious at the grave, but not this one. And he says, it would be insensitive in some cases to use the widow's son at Nain, because people could say, well, you know, he did this for her when he was in a state of lowliness. Now he's in a state of exaltation, he won't do it for me. And what he does is he kind of goes through it and he says, well, we have to sort of back up and we have to see what the real blessing is. And he does stuff with the widow's son at Nain. And he then makes an application of it where it can, com where it can actually comfort the survivors. And he gets into how we need to have um, a memorial, a commemoration of the departed in the liturgy. That's another one of his aspirations. I don't know to what extent he brought it in, but I think he really wants it in because of Helena. That's his driving force. And uh, it reminded me yesterday, Pastor Eckhart was preaching on the nobleman's son, uh, the nobleman from Capernaum who meets the Lord at Cana. And it, 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 the way he dealt with it reminded me of what Leia does. Because Leia sort of demonstrates that, well, if someone has died blessedly, would you really want to bring them back to this veil of tears? And they're only going to have a temporary stay anyway. And then he gets into, um, you know, the widow's son that has the union with Christ. And he talks about how the union of, with Christ, it's not only in the future, it's also in the present. It's here in the sacrament of the altar. And he really unfolds these things, and it becomes a gem of pastoral comfort. You know, and it's really very beautifully done.